The officials are ready. The fighters are in the ring. And they are ready. So for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble. So how are you? How are I'm you? Good. I'm doing good. I'm here in, in sunny Florida. It's finally sunny out because we had some I'll torrential downpours. Where in Florida? I'm in South Florida. I'm in Delray Beach. Ah, okay, okay. And where are you from originally? You're from New I'm York? From the Bronx. Yeah, I'm from the Bronx, New York. So I, I, I grew up in the Bronx. Um, I trained for boxing. I actually started at Omni Health and Fitness. It was a, a, a fitness gym. And then I went to the back and there was the boxing ring. That's when I went there. I was in an abusive relationship at 17. And um, I went to this fitness gym to better myself for, for my abusive boyfriend. And when I went to the back, there was a boxing ring. And I just, you know, I had come into contact with boxing when I was about 16 years old, when Tyson bit Holyfield's ear. And uh, I connected, yeah, and I speak about this in a lot of my interviews. So it's it's repetitive, but it's how it happened. I, I never really was connected to boxing at all. And even being Mexican and Irish, people were like, oh, you must've been raised in it. And I'm like, no. And I spent significant amount of time in Mexico, but um, I wasn't. It was actually the emotional component of Tyson that I really connected with. Right. And it was that rage, that inner, that inner rage and that, um, you know, inability to verbally express emotion that we would act out. And that's what I did growing up too. So when he actually, when he bit uh, Holyfield's ear, I was like completely like drawn to him, not so much the boxing. I was like, oh, what is this? And I'm like, oh man. But, you know, I feel like. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> that's exactly, you know. Whenever uh, I talk about this stuff, people are like, and some people I think don't even, and I always say like, give yourself permission. That's the one thing that I feel was a blessing for me was, you know, I struggled a lot when I was younger with emotion, with, you know, I had anger, I had fits. I used to slam my head against the wall when I was a kid because I couldn't express myself. I didn't know how to verbally express myself or ask for what I needed. So I it was, just, it was this turmoil inside and I'm not embarrassed because it's it, it, like I told you before, like, this is who I am. What I say is what I, I say, I'm not perfect. Yeah. You know, and, and my intentions are always good. Um, but it was really just back then it was really just this, this struggle, even in the abusive relationship, I didn't think I deserved better. You know, he was my best friend mm -hmm. and we, we were, we were, you know, we were best friends and then we, we got into a relationship and then he started, you know, he started doing steroids and that's where I think his mind shifted because he wasn't always like that, but I believed in the person he was, you know, and I, I didn't believe in the person that he was in front of me, you know, and I ac accepted the abuse, but, you know, and it all stemmed from, you know, my childhood, but it was all, it was all, it really started with me. I have a chemical imbalance. Um, I have, I'm, I have um, ADHD and I have seasonal affective disorder. So I was raised in, in a, in a bipolar household. You know, I have bipolar in my family and there's a lot of uh, mental illness in my family. Um, so it's, it's, it's inevitable that I'm going to have a chemical imbalance. And, and I did. And so, you know, I just learned how to deal with it and how to work through it. I didn't talk about it too much openly because it was my personal struggle, my personal battle that I just dealt with on my own. Um, and that also led to obviously the abusive relationship. And then, you know, I went to the back, I found boxing, but during that time of the abusive relationship, I developed an eating disorder. I was anorexic. And then when I found boxing, I had this amazing workout and I was losing all this weight. And I was, you know, I was 110 pounds and I, you know, I started taking ephedra because ephedra was big back then. Yeah, and, yeah right. That's right. Then, I remember all this stuff like and mental health wasn't as 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 and people people weren't as aware. There wasn't as much help back then also as there is now. So I definitely. Well, listen, and, when I when I was I was 14 and I went to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, he um, said I was bipolar. He diagnosed me as being bipolar. And he put me on lithium at 14 years old. Wow. And this is the guy who was sitting in this giant chair. I'll never forget because it's like embedded in my brain. He was sitting in a giant chair, smoking a cigarette, shaking, telling me I'm bipolar and putting me on lithium. Like that oh. would be unheard of today. Yeah, you know? I know. Like that's like, what? And, you know, so I, I ended up in, in the gym and, um, you know, I, and I feel like boxing, it was a gift from God. And, and, and I, I, I always like, cause I, I, I mean, my ex almost killed me. He almost strangled me to death. He punched me in my wow. face. The only time I've ever been 
It was a lot. And I, and I always, and I talk about it so lightly because it's not light, but I've healed because I've done the work to figure out how to be. And, you know, it's funny because when it got out into the boxing world that I was in this abusive relationship, people would ask me, oh, do you want to fight a man? Or did you want to fight him? And I'm like, no, yeah, I actually that. never wanted to fight him. I wanted, I was so focused on healing and trying yeah. to like, it's so like when you're in an abusive relationship, you're so self-absorbed almost like you're so self and I, I maybe not self-absorbed, but you're so focused on like, what did I do wrong? How can I fix this? You know, it's, it's, it's about them, but it's also about how you can make them better. But it always starts with like, what can I do? So I kind of shifted that to why did I allow this? Why did I accept this? What is wrong with me? Because there was something wrong with me. I love when people say, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. Of course there is. You're allowing yourself to be hit. So you're accepting some falseness about yourself. Some, yeah. some That's not true. So what is wrong with, with the fact that you think so low of yourself? Why? You know, you're, you're valuable. You're beautiful. Do you not believe it? Like, why don't you believe it? And finding out and, and doing things. There was a point in my life where I was at such a low, and this was during my boxing, that people didn't know, but I had post-its on the mirror in my bathroom to remind me that I'm beautiful, to remind me that I'm smart, to remind me that I'm capable. And if you would have seen me on the outside, you would have never known those things because, you know, I didn't show that because it was so personal. It was such a personal struggle that I was going through. And everybody saw this personality and this fame with million dollar baby and all this stuff. And they had no idea that I was inside, like, dying like it was just torturous oh you man know? even hard to even yeah like i can't even imagine what what you were going through because i remember when i was seven even you know obviously i this is nothing in comparison to to your story but just like my mindset of, of when i was in an in a relationship and how much i wanted to please that that woman and or your partner um and nothing else really mattered to me and there were crazy decisions that I made. They were just for love. You know what I mean? And then- oh, What you now, thought love was. Oh, exactly, exactly. That was our first time of like puppy love. So, you know, we didn't listen to anyone. We didn't listen to uh, our parents saying, don't worry, this is going to be better. Or, you know, uh, just anyone, you know what I mean? It was like, no, I know what I'm doing here. And really all that did was make me alone because I was sulking in my own thoughts. And then that caused me- to spiral, you know, and it was just, it was, it was, it was the toughest part, the toughest part, part of my life. So I can't even imagine, um, you know, what kind of strength you have to even be a survivor and be able to talk about it so openly or, or freely. It's so funny because I never, I think it's just, it's just who I am, Jay. Like I never thought about, people would tell me that I was strong. And even now, like people are like, you're so strong and I'm just doing what's next. Like I'm just in this, mo and I think it comes from upbringing. You know, I don't know your your family background, but I know for me, you know, I was raised in a, you know, a very, uh, an Irish Mexican Catholic home. And I was raised very, um, you know, my parents were together since they were 16 and 18. They'd never been with anybody else. They, you know, my father passed away two years ago and they were still married and they've gone through. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And, and you know, it was just like, and my dad was definitely a disciplinarian. And he was very much about raising me as a human. Like he, he, you know, he would teach me how to take care of myself and my mother too. I was very self-sufficient. My brother's very self-sufficient. You know, we were raised not really to need anybody so that we attracted the right partner. And it was interesting because I, I did attract kind of like, I think during my life, I always attracted guys that I thought I could fix. Like, oh, there's something wrong. I can fix them. And it was very yeah. codependent, you yeah. know? You know, so it's it's like, and that's where you end up in these abusive relationships and codependent relationships. And, you know, but I, I went through, I was in therapy since I was seven. And then I went to the therapist and I went through an array of things. And then I ended up in this abusive relationship because I was just attracting the wrong partner. And, you know, I don't know if my ex would have been the wrong partner had he not done, made the choices that he made. I still, to this day, don't, I'm not mad at him because I I don't think about him. I healed and I went on. He didn't kill me. He didn't, you know, he didn't, you know, he didn't do those things. I don't think he's a bad person. I think that he was sick and I think he needed help. And I find that when you can have compassion and empathy towards people, you heal. And I'm not a saint because believe me, there were times where, and there's times where I get mad and then I catch myself and I'm like, all right, it's like what they say. When you get mad at somebody else, it's really, you're like swallowing poison. Like you're poisoning yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and and that's why, like, you know, I, I just I went through I went through the boxing and I found that a lot of it was my own self healing and my self therapy and boxing just helped me so much, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually. And uh, I'm grateful that I found it, but I never dreamt of being a world champion. I never dreamt. I didn't even know about competition. We're talking 1998. Yeah. You know, yeah. Started, you know, and then I and then I walked into that gym and then, you know, 99, 2000, I started competing as an amateur in 2002. I was 21. I had my first amateur fight. But that went through me being rejected because back then, if you were feminine, you weren't, you didn't look like a fighter. And, you know, I've never been so, how can I say, like, I felt like when people tell me I'm too pretty to be a fighter, I was never so insulted of being called pretty in my life. <laughs> you know, I would get so mad and I didn't know how to, and I'm like, that's not a compliment. Like, <laughs> what? I can never, so I. When you were mentioning like that type of household and then I, I grew up in kind of the same household as you, you know, we were always we were always taught to provide for ourselves. But of course, we had the full support of our parents. You know, I was I was I was um, very fortunate. They sent me to college. All three of us is three brothers and we're all three. Apart. God bless your mother. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but wait, mom's but, Puerto Rican. Yeah, my mom's Puerto Rican. She's tough. She's tough. She can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's why I kind of. I, you know, I I, you I didn't look anything as you, but I understand yeah. the time and, uh, you know, just everything. I had to really, you know, bash down some walls to get, you know, not just myself. There were other women that went have similar stories that I have, you know, that, that probably didn't have such an easy road. I know they did it. You know, yeah. it, it was a lot. And there wasn't just Christy Martin, Layla Ali and, you know, these names, Lucia Riker that, you know, there were so many other women. And so, you know, um, and, but back then women's boxing wasn't accessible, you know, and that's why I always made myself so accessible to other athletes because I didn't have that. I didn't have the people that I could reach out to, although I was blessed to train with Alicia Ashley, you know, who was a okay. world champion. And, uh, you know, she, you know, I didn't know enough to ask the questions back then and the things I needed to know. And I think about like, what would, so yeah, I actually had a conversation in the gym the other day with a young girl who had her pro debut in boxing and I told her, I said, hey, listen, if you ever want to reach out, if you ever have a question about, you know, should I take this fight or what do you think about this? And I'll always give you my my experience, what I've experienced and my advice, but you have to make the decision on your own. But if you're ever looking for some feedback, yeah, um, of course. I'll never tell you what to do. I'll just give you, and if you don't do what I say, that's okay. I'm never going to say, oh, do this. I'm going to say, okay, this is what I would do. And this is how I see the situation. Just so you can get a different perspective from somebody who has experience. Of course, it's advice based on experience, and then they make their own decisions. Well, Absolutely. What's happening, what's happening today and what's happening on social media is that experience is not being respected. So people aren't really, they don't care that I have, you know, 34 fights and I, you know, and I have even life experience. Like I said in a post, I said, well, you know, and it's not a knock to these girls, but it's like, it's obvious. I'm like, they were boxing. I started boxing when they were six to 12 years old, a lot of them, or maybe six to 15 years old. Like I was, I turned pro in 2005. Like, like they probably saw, uh, they, if they look back, they probably would have noticed that they maybe saw some of your matches if they were into it back then, you know, because you well, were fighting. We weren't even, but we weren't even like a lot of our fights, but see, that's the thing. You can't blame them for not knowing who we are because a lot of our fights weren't televised. That's right. That's right. And that's why I sit back and I'm like, I would love to fight now. I mean, I am fighting, but I can look at tape. Like when I fought Calista Salgado, man, I had tape like crazy to see if her fights. And I'm like, yeah. great. Because I didn't yeah. have that back then, you know? So now it's like, oh, great. So now you know, people are always like, I fought girls. I didn't know Yulia Luna was 5'8 until the weigh-in. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I'm 5'4 or 5'7, whatever she was. And then she uh -huh. had a seven inch reach on me. I didn't know that until the weigh in. So I had yeah, to go, yeah. all right. Now you could find out everything before. You know, it. okay, it is so different. It, and and you literally have seen, I mean, you've lived the difference from, from when you first started till, till right now. And that's what's so interesting to me because I, you know, I wasn't in tune with, with women's boxing back then. Of course. It was, it was more of an adult an adult desire like I, I i really liked watching women's boxing when i was an adult because when you tell somebody that uh you walk into the gym and then you know the, the coach looked at you and they thought you were too beautiful or i i can imagine this stuff happening back then you know what i mean especially in new york 
yeah. if that, you know what I mean? So I understand where you're coming from. So that's where kind of things resonated between you and I, but yeah, I just want to- no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I love that. And that's, that's a big reason, Jay, that I share a lot of my story is because I get so many people that are like, oh my God, I can relate. And I find that relating is such a, it's such a, it's a support system. Oh. You know, it's yeah. such a connection. It's like an unspoken connection. I meet so many people that when they say, oh my gosh, like I, like I even on, you know, um, the fight post uh, did in the UK did a, a, a piece on me oh, and yeah, you- uh, I sent it to you and I shared it on my Instagram and I got so many people wrote back, like, you're such a warrior. You're such a, and I'm like, you know, to me, I, I value the compliments, but I don't know how to be anything else. I don't know how to not speak up. You know, and to go back to, you know, my situation right now is that I can't get fights, you know, and I ask them sometimes and I'm like, what, why, what is the problem? Is it my age? Is it like, what is it? Like there's a lot of little things. And I think that women's boxing in the U S you have, okay. You have Clarissa Shields, you have Nisha Strada, you have Michaela Meyer, you have, you have very few women in America that are being promoted. Amanda Serrano, you have like literally like five women that are being promoted in the United States. And a lot of those women, you know, they have to also fight in the UK. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. So it's, it's like, it's interesting because I mean, you see, but then those women get to fight, they fight in the United States, but then who else? Like you look at the UK and you see this stacked undercard of all these women. And then you have these title fights. Like they, so what's Eddie Hearn is matchroom is doing is they're building their roster and they're, they're they've asked, they offered me a fight at 130 pounds. Why are they offering me that? Because they think like, oh, she'll jump at the money. No, no, I never, I, I never boxed for the money. That wasn't why I did it. Cause I'm, you know, I, I have an education. I have other things that I can do. I have plenty of other things I can do. I boxed because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to compete and I wanted to learn. I wanted to grow. And I just love the sport. Yeah, um, you don't want to fight for money. You want, you want what you I don't do it for clout, like all this yeah. stuff. Like I, I just, and even I'm, I'm not as active on my Instagram. I work a full-time job. You know, I'm an executive assistant to Phil DeRue and I, I do, like, there's a lot there and, and, you know, building a business is exciting. It's fun. It's, you know, nerve wracking, but it's also like a challenge and I'm able to still get my training in, but it's nice to you staying ready at 42 and staying ready at 30 is a lot different or 35, know. you know, I know. I can feel it already. I I feel it. You know what I mean? Like, it's like preparation for things now. Like, you know, I can't just uh, pull the trigger on, on just uh, on things. uh, So I understand. Yeah. I I trade smarter, not harder. And um, you know, it just, it's just, and I'm not like, I chose to do this. I choose to do this. And um, it's just, it's, it's just frustrating when you sit there and you've worked, you've worked, you've worked. And then they're like, oh yeah, you can just step aside and we're going to do this. And I'm like, but I know what it is. It's that women's boxing in the U.S. isn't promoted. The U.K. Matchroom is doing great thing for women boxing, but they're having women skip the lines. And I don't blame the women. Like I had a conversation, well, not a conversation, but I had a little back and forth with Ebony Bridges. And people take my texts and they take it sensitive and they want to get however, they thought I was being mean to a text that I, a tweet that I sent to Ellie Scottney. I'm like, listen, I'm not with this whole PC culture thing. I'm, I speak what I am. If you want to read something the wrong way, I can't, how you feel reaction to my tweet is not my responsibility. She was like, boxing stinks. And I was like, I said, and I said to her, I said, you know, I know. I, how would you feel that you, you, yeah, I get it. I've been there where you have a fight lined up. I had a fight lined up with her. I had a signed contract and then they just, they just yeah. left me. And so I'm like, I, and I get it. I said, cause she had the fight with, um, she had the fight with uh, Shanika Johnson and yeah. then Chantel Cameron asked, could, because of the issues with, with uh, Barry McGuigan, the, tra- the trainer, they yeah. asked that she not be on the card. And then it happened and she's like, oh, boxing stinks. And I, and I said, I said, if that's, if, if, if you know, you're six and oh, like you, you boxing stinks now, like try getting to 30, 30 and two with 13 knockouts and going through 18 year career. And, and, and feeling that way. Like, can you withstand that? Because if that's going to affect you that much, you're very fortunate to be in that position, to be fighting on these cards and to be getting the activity that you're getting. Because it wasn't like that for women like myself coming up during yeah. that time. So I said, toughen up, Buttercup. 
Oh, that's what did and it? And then it was like, oh, you're so mean. And I'm like, okay. Like, oh, but you know what? Wrong, <laughs> man. Like, we were raised, you know. We yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm actually not a mean person. I'm a super nice, kind, giving person. But they're yeah. like, oh, how did you mean that? I was like, I meant it like I said it. Like, I don't know what you want me to say. Like, I, I mean, oh, you're not showing her support. S- support for what? Like, I'm telling her that this is life. And if this is going to, yeah, box, you know. And then Ebony Bridges commented back. And again, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to attack her. But she, I said, you fought for a belt you didn't earn. I said, you were ranked number eight. And you fought a number nine, ranked nine girl in Shatton Courtney for the title. And she's like, oh, I didn't know. I got the fight on, on a four weeks notice. I'm like, four weeks is a nice amount of time because I've gotten fight offers on 10 days notice, you know, or two weeks notice. So four weeks isn't bad. And she was like, you know, so I took the opportunity and I was like, okay, well, you should, you, you didn't know you were ranked number eight and that you were fighting a number nine ranked girl. And you think that you're the best. You might, you might be promoting a super fight here, actually, to be honest. No, not, you know, it's just, I, again, though, but it's not like I'm not calling out these women. I'm just trying to educate them. But I don't know if they want to be educated. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I'm like, do you realize? Like, Tiara Brown is going through it right now. Tiara Brown can't get a fight. They're promoting Sky, um, Sky Nicholson like she's the next big thing. And I'm like, all right, put her in against Tiara. Then somebody told me, oh, you should fight Tiara at a catch weight. So it's that doesn't it's- make sense. <laughs> like that doesn't even make sense like for what i'm ranked number two by the ibf why would i why can't tiara fight at 126 and why can't i fight at 122 and we succeed in our weight classes why do we have to fight each other to make a there's plenty of girls in my weight class there's plenty of girls in her weight class to, to, yeah. yeah exactly exactly that's like, the, you, oh, know, no, you guys go fight each other because why we're americans like i don't understand you know I, okay so i speak to a lot of uh, uk I've spoken to UK female boxers um, and male boxers, and it seems like the consensus was always that they wanted to come to America to fight. But now, it almost seems like they don't want to come to America because they have a good thing going on. Okay, and it is being controlled. I feel like by Matchroom, you of know. It, what other promoter is promoting women's boxing? Like him? Oh, like boxer. him? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's it. Again, UK. So the yeah, UK yeah. is doing it. Then you've got you've got the United States again. You know, I, what do you, I, why, why do you think that? It, what is okay? Give me give me your your honest take on why you think that you're not you're not receiving the attention because I can't think think of a reason other than they think that maybe you're going to win. I know, but and, why why would he have me sign a contract with options? He gave me options. So okay, like, wait. Cool. So, so can you tell us, okay, can you tell us this exact situation that happened between? Okay, okay. yeah. So so what happened was on, um, so uh-huh. I was ranked number two. I'm ranked number two by the IBF. Ellie Scott, he's ranked number one. Shanika Johnson is the champion. Yes. Uh, whether Shanika Johnson should be champion or not is a whole other story because she fought for a vacant belt after coming off a loss and she fought a girl that had also come off a loss for the belt. So we'll just yes. leave it there. Okay, so now you've got the champion, Shanika Johnson. She fights Susie Ramadan, who is actually three weight classes under her. Okay, defends her belt against Susie Ramadan. Again, who's with three weight classes under her. Defends the belt. Uh, then she has a huge gash in her head. So medically, she's not able to fight till at least June. So, right. so now it's like, okay, cool. You got Ellie Scott at number one, Maureen Shea at number two. The IBF comes in and says, okay, instead of the belt just sitting around, let's order an interim world title against Ellie Scott and Maureen Shea. And then the winner of that will fight Shanika Johnson. All right, cool. Matchroom, I don't think really like that too much, but they had to follow suit because the IBF ordered it and my manager pushed too and said, hey, let's go. Okay, we offered, we said, okay, send us a contract. They want to do the fight, no problem. You want to do in the UK? Let's go. He sends me a contract. I get the contract. I get options um, for three fight option deal after, after you know, I win. Okay, it looks like a win-win for Eddie Hearn, to be honest, because I beat Ellie Scottney. You got options on me. You got me for three fights. I think three it was fight. three fights. Yeah, an option deal. So I'm like, okay, it's a win-win. And then you've got a young girl who lost to who? A 30 and two rank, a 30 and two girl who has two world titles. Like, not a bad loss. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, what's this undefeated uh, record nonsense? Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I have two losses early in my career too. You know, it mm-hmm. happened, but I continued on. I did great. And I and I learned and I grew and whatever. So then um, 
then I, I send back my contract. This was February 18th. I send back my contract. They asked me to take pictures, send pictures for the poster. I did everything. Then I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, how come we're not hearing anything about the fight? So my manager says, hey, what's going on? Still, we hear nothing. And then we find out that Sharnika Johnson is now available to fight and that Ellie Scottney is now fighting Sharnika Johnson. And I'm like, because, and then everybody's like, oh, well, you got to understand the champion's available now. I'm like, okay, so then, okay, that's great. The champion's available, have them fight. But how about you offer me, have an immediate, immediate hmm. defense against me. So yeah. I don't have to wait nine months till they yeah. defend. And then nothing. I got nothing, still nothing. They haven't even, first of all, Eddie Hearn called me Maureen O'Shea. No disrespect, but my name is Maureen Shea. Uh, you know, just get it right. But, you know, yeah. oh, you know, I, I get it. I get why people, it's been called that before. But, you know, he has no, like, he doesn't, you know, it's like, it's not even an issue. Like, but it needs to be, it needs to be said that like, okay, so now what? So now I'm just sitting here like, and now yeah. I still can't get a fight because girls will either price themselves out or I got to go to like the Dominican Republic or I got to go to Colombia. You know, I got to go. It's like, it's, it's, it's like, it's just ridiculous that I can't, I'm a draw. I can't even fight in my own country. <laughs> like, this is crazy. You could have been good at the Canelo uh, fight coming up, you know, with your Mexican background, Dublin. Uh, I mean, where you know what I mean, like. Well, that's the thing. The fight, so then, what happened was Ellie Scottney was supposed to fight in Dublin. Then they're like, "Oh, so Shanika Johnson wasn't supposed to be available until June, but yeah. apparently, miraculously, she got medically cleared for May twentieth. Hey, right? Katie Taylor card. It's a big card, you know. And she's like, "Oh, that's a big card for me to fight on. I'll take it. Or maybe there was money involved. I don't know. I'm just speculating." And then all of a sudden she's available. Then the whole thing happens with Chantel Cameron's team and Ellie Scottney. So now they're fighting June 10th in England. Now Shanika Johnson is fighting Ellie Scottney June 10th in England. Yeah, in her in 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 Ellie's. So it's it this listen, I was I agreed to fight in Sheffield, England. I was gonna fight on the 29th. But what happened was then they, they told me that the card on the 29th wasn't happening, that it fell through or something. And they were looking for, I think they were just buying time. I mean, I don't know, but I don't think it was done in good faith. I think there was oh, injury. Match. They said no. They That's said right. that, oh yeah, the 29th card was yeah. So I'm like okay, so but it was like no, no, it wasn't even discussed. It wasn't even like okay, we're gonna look for. They did. I don't think Matchroom ever wanted to fight me. I don't think they still intend to fight me. But this is where the sanctioning bodies need to step in and say, hey, like they're supposed. The sanctioning bodies are there to protect us, and yeah. and you can't just have uh -huh. people jumping lines and getting ahead when. And then calling, and then that's what frustrates me. It's like, you know, and again, it's not, I respect everybody that gets in that ring. And I know how hard this sport is. I've been doing it for 18, for more than 18 years, more than actually 25 years, more than half my life. But I'll tell you that, how is that okay for you just to be like, oh, well, I'm, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm with this one, so I'm going to get ahead. And in the politics and everything, but how, when is it not right anymore? When does somebody speak out? And I, I'm like, listen, I have nothing to lose at this point. You know, people saying like, how long are you going to fight for? And this and that. I leave it in God's hands. I've always have. And I walk in faith. And everybody knows I've always hashtag led by faith. Jeremiah 29 11 is my life first because I shouldn't be here today for a number of reasons. And I'm here. And God brought me to boxing for a reason. And I'm mm -hmm. sitting there. And I'm just like, okay, God, what is my purpose now? And if it's to speak out for women that don't speak out or are afraid to speak out, then I'm going to speak out. And I've gotten a lot of a lot of feedback. Susie Ramadan has been a big supporter of me speaking out. Tiara Brown has been a big supporter of me speaking out. Um, Franchon Cruz, um, you know, a, a lot of these women, uh, Logan Holler, who just fought, um, she just fought out, out in, in, I think it was in, in Scotland or in England too. I have a lot of support from, from these women that understand, mm -hmm. see, and I'm, you know, it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not going to help women's boxing. Like women's boxing in the United States isn't going to survive this. Because like, who are they promoting now? Michaela Myers, and Nisha Strada. Okay, then they're done. Then who, who are you bringing up? Where is the younger generation? There's no opportunity. And I don't know if they realize that the United States is not bringing any younger girls up. I didn't even really, I didn't even really realize that, that all the, all the fighters under 10 fights are all pretty much from the, are they are from the UK actually, right? And they yeah. get, and they're promoting this Nina Hughes. Oh, she's 41 years old and we took her she, in, no, she's 40 years old and she made, she became a world champion in four fights. That title alone is weird, but she's mm -hmm. four and oh, and she became, oh. how did she get that opportunity? How did she, how did she just fight? I think that they thought that it was just going to be a walk in the park. No, I think what happened was JD Mitchell won the belt against, um, who did she beat? Shannon Shannon Courtney. Courtney. 
Okay, so yep. she beat Shannon Courtney. So Jamie Mitchell's an American, and they're like, "Oh no, no, we can't have the American." They sign, they sign Jamie Mitchell to whatever a, a, a fight deal. They have her fight another girl from the UK. The girl from the UK beats her. And now the UK has the titles. It's like a yeah. game. Now all the U, now the UK has all the titles. It is like a game. The women in the weight classes. I mean, look at Clarissa Shields. Nobody can beat Clarissa, so it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, Clarissa is. I mean, Clarissa fought enough. Why does she have to go to the UK to fight? You know, she did, which is fine. You know, <laughs> but she's I mean, now she's fighting Hannah Gabriel uh, again for the, another fight. But but I mean, she's kind of running out of opponents because her her weight class is a little it's a little more shallow than the 126, yeah. 118 118s. So it's not that there's no women to fight for me. But then they're what? saying it's because you need a promoter. It's because you need a promoter. I said I'm I'm world ranked. Why do I need a promoter? Why should I give thirty percent of my purse to a promoter? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's, I mean, now it's like, oh, well, if you don't, you can't fight unless you have a promoter, unless you pay us. Like, is that this? Like, kind of like, uh, that's what, okay, now let me ask you this. What? Okay. With, with Sugar, Sugar Neeks. Can, as soon as they fight, or let's say, are you going to go to that fight, actually? I was planning on going to the Ireland card. So, yeah, I'll probably be there. I have to just make sure, yeah, I can make my figure out my schedule it's june we got a little bit so yeah that's right that's right because is there a way that they're going to be able to bypass you that's what after- i'm saying i don't know i mean look you, at what's done already you have to sit in limbo and just just hope for the best like there's there's nothing that like the sanctioning body can can do Did you- i think the sanctioning or- body needs to order an immediate defense an immediate defense. Okay, so yeah, that's what I wanted to. That's, so the solution here is that the IBF would have to order an immediate defense. And what is the probability that they would do that? Do they do that often? I mean, I think they're doing it with Shadisha Green because now. Oh yeah, um, Sean Cruz is fighting um, Savannah Marshall, and then I, they said the WBC said they have to do an immediate defense against Shadisha Green. Yeah, Shadesha. That's right. That's right. First, Shadesha was supposed to fight with um, um, Shadesha was supposed to fight Franchon. That was the first order, and then so it kind of happened like what happened to me. But the WBC said she's going to be the immediate defense against Shadesha Green, and I know Shadesha trains with one of my coaches, um, with Terrific Gist, and Terrific. uh, I won my NABF title with Terrific. Oh, that's awesome! I was Terrific's first female champion. Oh, look at that. That's yeah. crazy. So, so he, and that's my dog, man. I'm happy. I love him. That's my boy. I talk to him. You know, we we always message. He knows I love him so much, you know. And anytime I go out to PA, I always hit him up, like, come through. And, you know, he, he's a great trainer. And I've seen him. I mean, I won the belt in 2010, I think it was, or 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, the ABS title. And I have a picture of me and Terrific. And he's picking me up. And, yeah, <laughs> oh, I love him. And... and- you know, you have so much, you have, you do have internal support here in the U.S., but it's like, it really seems like the only, the only people that will be able to really make a change is, is the sanctioning body, right? Because it feels like, are they, are they able to, or even, did they even offer you any, they didn't offer you anything to step aside, nothing, right? Like, there's no, but like, imagine that happened with the men. Yeah, it does. Yeah, exactly. Why is it allowed to happen to? Because and that's what, boxing, I think that it would just, I mean, it shouldn't, it shouldn't happen, but it's yeah, like, this is where it, like, it just, I think the whole thing like sets us back. So if, I mean, you know, my opinion right now, the world is kind of going through what it's going through. And it's, I mean, you know, there's things that I don't agree with and I sit back and all I know is I can, I'm me and I can just continue to be me. And like I said, I, I give it to God and I just continue doing what's meant for what's best for me. And that's all I can do. But I, I, I learned not to let the business of boxing take away my love for the sport. But man, is it hard? I get so tired. I get so tired. Sometimes I'm like, oh, like I don't want to hear about it anymore. You know, I, I just I get so frustrated and tired of it because it's like, break. Psychological- people could just you know, nothing will happen if you're not vocal or active, right? Like you have to stay vocal and active to stay busy into the sport. It seems like right now. And I'm not like, I'm not calling out these girls. I'm not calling out. And, you know, you know, I just don't care to do that. You know what I mean? Like for what I'm ranked, like, why do I call somebody out? I should be the next in line to fight for the title. You know what I mean? Like, I don't understand this. It's just, it's just ridiculous. 
And then, you know, it's also the sacrifices that I've made. And you hear about all these younger girls making all these sacrifices. I'm like, how about somebody who's been doing it for 25 years? How about somebody who's sacrificed, you know, my life? I mean, I moved to California for my mental health. I didn't have children. And people like, oh, you just didn't want kids. I'm like, no, that's not what, that's not actually at all what happened, you know? And now, and you know, it's, it's, you know, these girls, they're getting to, getting to get their, achieve their goals earlier than, than we got to. And, and also now, like, why am I still here? Like I've dedicated my life to this. And now it's like, oh yeah, by the way, go just disappear. Like, that's what it feels like. I, 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 that's what it feels like to me too. That's what I was, that's what I was trying to kind of say. Like if it almost seems like if you, it, like, if you're not vocal and active that they just might forget. And it's like, no. to be active. We need more opportunity to fight on these cards. And the UK, they're giving, they're keeping these girls active. They're putting on shows and they're putting women on these shows. It's not just one fight, one female fight. There's like five, four or five, or it's an all female card. But then you got the United States, they're putting on a woman here, no woman, no women here. Then maybe a woman here, maybe two women here. And you saw how good that the all women's card did. I mean, you know, uh, it was an MSG. It was, it was amazing. And I just don't understand why it's not, it's not like it's a lack of money. It's a lack of promotion and, and it's not, you know, it's investment. Like, you know, and I know top rank, I fought for top rank and I had a, I had a conversation with Bob Arum. Bob Arum has always been clear on his lack of belief in women's boxing, but that's yeah. what he believes. I'm not mad at him for it. I mean, that's what he believes, but you know, what about other, you know, other, other promoters? You know, and, and they're just very, I mean, I fought for everyone. I really, I fought for top rank. I fought for golden boy. I fought for, uh, uh, star boxing, Joe DeGuardia. I fought for Lou DiBella. I mean, I fought for Murad Muhammad. If you want to go back that far, I fought him at Vander Holyfield's undercard when he fought Prezzo Kendo, you know, I could, there you go. Look at that. That's so crazy. You know, and I, I fought on, um, I fought on Miguel Cotto's undercard. He fought Michael Jenkins I, at the garden. It was so funny at the press conference, I'll never forget. I went up and I addressed the media in Spanish and English. And it was when Miguel was working on his English. And he was <laughs> he came up after me. He's like, oh, now I got to follow that. He said it in Spanish. And I just, I just smiled, you know, but they were very respectful and supportive. You know, I was, you know, I, and then I fought on, um, I was co-featured as Shane Mosley. I was the first female in over a decade to fight on pay-per-view on Shane Mosley, my orga too. Yes, that was crazy That's fight. Wonderful. Oh my gosh, you know I remember exactly what I was doing during that fight. And I was probably watching your fight, actually. I didn't even realize this. Yeah, so. I was the co teacher and I, 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 and my fight ended in a draw. I wanted the immediate rematch and uh, Yulihan's team didn't want the immediate rematch. And then I took a, I took a stay busy fight. I got injured and then she got pregnant and her and I never had got to, you know, make that complete. Well, what can we do here to make this happen? I mean, what I getting I mean I'm just going to keep talking you know what I mean and keep sharing I, what's going on and I think it's not again I want it to be known that it's not just about me this is going to affect other women it's not just affecting me I'm just in a place now where you know it's happening to me and 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 this is going to happen again and again and again if, if people don't speak out you know people like myself and other women don't start to understand what's going on and ask these questions and why is this happening and be active hey you got your platforms on Instagram and Twitter Go on and speak and say, hey, how come I can't get a fight? Why am I out there looking, hey, has anybody got a fight? Like, that's, that's ridiculous. That should be, how are we going to grow boxing in the United States when these girls have to beg for fights? Oh, yeah. nobody wants to pay. Nobody wants to do this. Nobody wants to do that. And I'm like, well, women's boxing is going to die in the United States then. Because, like, I, like who, who are they grooming? Where's our, where's our, our where's our, um, that's you know, a good question. Who, where's, who, our feeder? where's our feeder? Like, you know, Matchroom has, Chrome is grooming these girls and they're, you know, they're building up all these girls. What, what about us? What about us? We have nobody. Yeah. We have nothing. And the Olympics might not even happen and for boxing. So what then what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. They're not grooming. That's a good word. Grooming. They're not grooming anyone here in the U.S. Nope. Now that I, I'm not thinking. Nobody, they're not. They're just like, you know, I mean, I know Golden Boy has uh, Fondora's sister. Um, you know, she's, you know, he they put on girls here and there, but the only consistent ones I see, you know, I don't see consistent, they don't have consistency, you know, where Michaela Meyer has consistency, 
and and now Sinisa Strahd has got consistency. These girls are consistently active. Then they're like, oh, who, who do you want to fight? I'm like, can I just stay busy so I can, you know, why do I have to wait two and a half years to fight or wait a year? I haven't fought in a year. They're like, oh, you're still fighting? Do you know how tired I am of hearing that? Oh, you still fight? I'm like, yeah, I just can't get a fight. If it, if it was your choice, you would fight three times a year, easily. Four. What are four? I mean, yeah. I, I don't think I've ever fought, and only in the beginning of my career, before anything that I fight that often. Wow. I mean, I came off of, and I got, and it's funny because, again, no credit for coming off a two and a half year layoff and fighting a legit, like, Clarissa, Calista Salgado was a legit opponent like she fought yeah. everybody and she's and she was in top shape and I actually fought her at her weight class which is 122 you know I went at 121 I think she weighed in at 119 like we legit were like right there and I'm coming off I'm older and I'm coming off a two and a half two and a half year layoff and I went eight rounds I didn't want a six rounder I didn't want no she was no tune up she's like a fight you know I and I, I know, yeah and people looked at me and they were like man the doctors could have been like you're in amazing shape like you're, I'm like, yeah, why would you think I, I mean, Jerry Cooney was like, how are you going to feel in the later rounds and your legs get tired? I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not a man. Like women are different, man. Our endurance, we don't lose our endurance, you know? And I don't, my bone density is, is, is great because I lift weights. You know, I yeah. keep, I maintain my mature muscle. I don't overtrain. Like how come Bernard Hopkins can do it? Roy Jones can do it, but oh, you're 41. You're still fighting. I'm like, George Foreman. Like, I mean, yeah. all, all these all. The sport has has changed so much, so so much, and now that I'm now that I'm even thinking about it, it's like, yeah, age age shouldn't be isn't an issue because there people are coming back out of retirement to fight these exhibitions or fight even real fights or people that are not really people that are not supposed to be fighting are being televised fighting now. Look at, look at what look at what great okay so game bread had a fight. So now you've got fight fans, you've got the Jake Paul fans. Again, not against Jake Paul. I've been around him training. You know, he's a great, he does the basics really, really well. He's coming up like any other fighter. He's not fighting, you know, top yeah. level, he'll get killed. You know, he you know he's smart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot yeah. of credit. Um but then you look at like game bread boxing had a show on. It was basically MMA fighters boxing. You had like maybe two legit boxing matches on that night. The commentators, however, were were the female fights that they aired. They're saying this was championship level fighting. So now you've got these fans that are not educated and they're MMA fans. They're getting into boxing because of their because of these fighters fan bases. And they're thinking that the way these women are fighting is championship level. I know. They're being sold lies. And I I literally I went on Game Bread Box. Yeah, so now I'm not going to be that girl like, oh, I'll get in there and I'll fight. No, all I said was like, clearly these these promoters, I mean, these these commentators, I mean, Timothy Bradley didn't even speak until the boxing fights came on. He barely said anything. And I know damn well, Timothy Bradley was not about to say those women were championship level because Timothy's seen it. You know what I mean? He so come on. He itching to say something because, uh, you know, his commentary all the time. is. <laughs> and, and the guys are like, oh, you know, and but I'm like, I just sat there and it infuriated me because I'm like, it's number one, it's unfair. And number two, it's lying to the public. Like you're miseducating the public. Like it's just not, it's not, it's it's just not right, you know? And and so I, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, uh, and, and, you know, I think, I think what Masvidal is doing is great. You know, he's a big boxing guy like he loves boxing, you know, um, mm -hmm. but it's again, and I think there's, you know, Vitor Belfort is one of my stable mates and he trained and he trains with my coach, Derek Santos. Vitor's wonderful. And Vitor puts the work in and Vitor always tells people, he's like, she's the most avoided fighter about me. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it is what it is, but like, he, we always talk cause we're the veterans. So him, myself, um, Chris Algieri's in the gym. So we're the three veterans in the gym. Yeah. So it's like, you know, we talk and I've known Chris for years. You know, I knew Chris from the beginning of both oh, our careers. Long Island. He's from Long Island, right? Yeah. And yeah. Chris, also, Chris also came out to California when I was living in Oxnard and he was training at Robert Garcia's gym when I was training at Knuckleheads with Victor Ortiz's camp. Ah, okay. And wow. Like, you oh, literally I knows you. I mean, it's just like, it's like. I was the only female that trained at the boxing laboratory under Lomachenko's team. I'm the only one. I dragged with Lomachenko. I used to run with the team and I trained at the boxing lab. And, and, and you know, there's things that I've done and this is my experience, but I think that, you know. Maybe people are, uh, maybe they really are afraid. Maybe they didn't, it, it literally is ducking. Like 
I trained with um with Lomachenko's team. I trained yeah, just training and conditioning with the with the old Olympians there in Oxnard. Yeah, you're you're, and you're then, experienced. Yeah, and I've been to you know, and I've been around. I trained with Tommy Brooks for a little bit, and then Tommy had to go left for LA. This was in 2010. And then I trained with that's when I trained with Terrific Gist, which is Shadesha Green's coach. And yep, then yep. But I've worked with Hector Roca. I worked with a lot of, you know, lot, all my coaches were were top level. I work with Derek Santos now, who's worked with Sullivan Barrera, uh, yep. uh, you know, Sergey Kovalev. Yeah, I mean Chris Algieri. He worked with. He worked, you know. So I, I I've always been around. I trained with Phil Deru. So Phil Deru mm-hmm. is my strength and conditioning coach, which I find now my strength and conditioning coach is probably the most my strength and conditioning is probably the most important thing for me right now to maintain my longevity in the career in my career. Because yeah, exactly. it's hard, yeah. not hard. Yeah, and then you know you you haven't had a fight or haven't had a fight in a while, so you have to stay busy with with the strain. strain you, want about, you want to talk about like mental illness. You want to talk about like mental challenges. Like, I mean, I'm not gonna go out there and be like, oh yeah, like I, you don't think this is depressing? You don't you don't think that people don't think like I like this doesn't this doesn't cause me depression? I'm blessed that I have the tools to work through this. And to figure out a way because getting up every day and going and, you know, getting the excitement of like, oh, yeah, I got a contract. I signed for a fight. And then it's like, bye. And now it's like, okay, now what? Like, you and don't think. There's mentally- no, no, no light at that end of the tunnel right now. There's like. And that's what kind of upsets me also, because. It's unfair. It's unfair. And people say like, oh, life isn't fair. I'm well aware. But then there's then there's laws in place and rules in place you know, for that. But like what, like, I'd like to know, I'd like to ask him, what do you expect me to do? You want me to just disappear? You know, like, I would love to sit right. Like, I don't know if he can handle me because I, I could, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You you never had a Bronx girl on your card, man. I don't know. We, maybe, we don't have a like, yeah. Maybe he feels like there's a, uh, you know, you're, yeah, you're yeah. at the same level. You know what I mean? With intelligence, with the intelligence of the sport, everything, the experience. So maybe I guess, he, I, yeah, I mean, I get the business. I get it. And I would love to sit down and have a conversation with him and say, okay, like explain, because I have a rebuttal. I understand. The only thing he could say is like, well, you know, like you don't need me. I'm like, like, I need him more than he needs me. And it's like, that's nice. So then you're going to say that to every other female fighter out there. Just so female fighters need to understand that's how it works now. So you're being used. I'm not saying that's what's happening. I'm just <laughs> saying like, yeah, if they say it to you, if that's the reason, then they have to. I don't to know. Be- like, I don't know the reason. I have to sit there and think about what's the reasons. Well, he doesn't really need me because he's got these girls skipping lines and he's got these, you know, he's getting these opportunities and he's creating this. And, you know, like, oh, well, you don't have the backing. What do I need you for? Let me ask. OK, let me ask you this scenario. What happens? What happens if you get the fight after after um, Sugar and, and Ellie fight? You get the winner. You win. And then you decide that that that, that would be your last fight. That you want to I, I absolutely would not <laughs> no way i want to defend i'd go on i'd be like sure throw them all come on okay. so that? there's no you're, you don't you don't want to retire at all there's oh, no, no of course. Maybe, I have, it, it's got it listen if my career is going in a certain direction yeah i mean i get it will make like keep me active but i'm not going to keep going through this nonsense yeah i can sit down and have an adult conversation a professional adult conversation And I can be like, okay, I want to make it worth it for you and worth it for me. Let's talk business. Let's talk numbers. What are you looking to do? And you had the options and you signed the, you signed the options. You know what it is, mate? Okay. This is, I mean, I, I'm just throwing things out there because I I really can't really figure out the reason why, just like how you can't figure out the reason why. How about you see his, his stable and maybe he feels that he can groom them more easily than he could groom you because you're a veteran and that maybe that's a threat to him. Do you think he feels like that at all? I mean, no, because what do you got to groom? I'm already made. I speak two languages. I mean, come on, bro. How marketable. I mean, the only thing I don't do is pose naked and I'm not going to weigh in in lingerie. Sorry, but I got a mouth and I can talk. And I'm also, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I have an education. I have my background, my story, everything that I stand for is, is, you know, pretty, and my, my electronic footprint is consistent. You know, right. I mean, I, I know how to tell a story. I know how to share my story. I think, I think it's almost like a, like a, it's like a, like a Rocky situation. Like, you know, like, oh, she came, like, I never thought I'm coming back because I've been here, but people don't know. That's why I'm sitting there and I'm like, 
yeah, you're not brand new here. Like, but oh, you know what? I like how you spoke up on on Twitter. I feel like I feel like that might be the only solution right now is to do what we're doing. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's, you know, it's like I, I just and again, like I went in with um with another UK based uh you know they were and I wasn't trying to be mean because they're like oh like who have you fought and I'm like because they were trying to say, well they were trying to say like oh all the girls on your record I'm like. I didn't, ha did you know, like you claim to have followed boxing since Jane Couch, but you realize women's boxing wasn't in the Olympics until 2012. You yeah. realize I didn't have the opportunity to have as many fights and be as active as a lot of these women, right? You realize that I fought my second fight against a national champion because, oh. yeah, I went to, I paid my way to nationals. I fought in three national tournaments and paid my way because I couldn't get fights. You know, I fought in the Golden Gloves. Like it was, it was, you know, it was great. It was great. I had 12 mm -hmm. fights. I went on, I got great experience. And then there was an opportunity after Million Dollar Baby to turn pro. And, and I said, okay, well, what, what's next? Like, what am I doing this for? And I know Christina Cruz stayed amateur for a really long time. We're seen as a friend of mine. And she stayed amateur until recently. And she's having trouble getting fights. And it yeah. doesn't matter what her background is. You know what I mean? Like now it's like, because women's boxing in the United States is not being promoted that's 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 the the whole thing right there that's it right that's that is big, the problem it's a big piece of it it's a big piece not like they are in the uk like i said i'm not listen what matchroom is doing is great what eddie Hearn's doing is great he's doing it i'm not mad at him but you can't skip lines because there is a federation international federation that you can't just skip lines and and be like oh well you know i'm so glad that that you actually educated me on this situation because you know i did what you know i watched I watched what everyone else can see, you know, wh whatever you put out out there and everything like that. But now you're breaking it down and I really do understand it. And I think the only light at the end of the tunnel. <sighs> I mean, it's to keep talking. And again, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, yeah. again, I'm not, look, I'm not out here. The UK did a great article, read the article because it shares a bit of my story. And a lot of people like even Tiara Brown, Tiara Brown is she's with my manager and she didn't know about my, about million dollar baby. She didn't know about the struggles that I went through to get to where I am. It's not like I just showed up here and was like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm a professional fighter. Like, I have 100,000 Instagram followers. Like, put me on. You know what I wanted to touch on? Actually, the million dollar baby story. Yeah. And how, how did you get that opportunity to um, or I take was, that training? I trained, I trained with Hector Roca at the time. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Hillary came to the gym. And um, I worked really well with sparring, I never, I never tried to hurt anybody in sparring because I was working, I was always working and I yeah. never said a hundred percent. So he trusted me to be able to work with Hillary. Um, and oh. he knew that she hit me. I wasn't going to retaliate and just like hurt her. So yeah. we she partnered me with her and then her and I became friends. And mm -hmm. there was a point where her father and my father watched us spar, you know, her father passed as well. I think the same time my dad passed, you know, so it's, 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 it's interesting. It was a great point in my life. And it was interesting. It was just an amazing journey. And it is an experience that I was literally thrust into a spotlight. You know, I, I in my Golden Gloves final bout, I had Access Hollywood in my locker room. I had things that I was 24 years old. I was on, I was on X, I was on um E Entertainment. I sparred with Joan Rivers. I was on CNN. I had friends calling me like Maureen, I'm on a plane going to Puerto Rico and you're on CNN. I was on E, I was in um, Sports Illustrated. I was, you know, all these different things, you know, I, I got all this. I remember my quarterfinals bout in the Golden Gloves um, after the fight. I, I saw a stage, the stage lit up because the lights, obviously we were, they were like, the lights were on when we were fighting. But then like when I came to and I looked, there was a stage full of cameras and I thought they were there for the Golden Gloves, not to know they were there for me. And when I got, when I won and they took me off the stage, they brought me to the back and there was this cameras all around me and microphones like this. And I thought I went to grab one thinking it was a bottle of water. Cause I was like, what is going on? Like, what is happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, I was literally like, just, it was like a, it was like a thrust into a spotlight. And I was like, what is happening here? Like, I don't get this, you know? Cause then I was the real million dollar baby. Like I didn't give myself that name. It was given to me. Yeah. That, that, that's a huge part of you. your whole life is just kind of, I mean, your whole story, honestly, I think that, uh, do you have a documentary yet or anything? Um, like, no, no, no you, I, 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 I know I'm writing a book. I'm, I'm writing a book. I have my chapters and my sub chapters and I, and I, I might be working with a publishing agent. I'm, I'm, I'm working on some things, but 
no i don't i don't really i don't have anything you know story i feel like would, would not only easily be able to to sell but everyone there's something about like your your life your little stages of life that will resonate with with at least one person out there every you know every single person will have something to well, resonate I, with. I do, do I do motivational speaking and with my motivational speaking I've had those compliments to pe from people and from the youth like I've had oh, young people that I yeah. can completely relate I, to them, or they're going through it or they've gone through it or you know and you're super comfortable to speak to speak to you know it's I just felt like uh one, once we started talking I, yeah. I was nervous yeah, I know, and I, but it, it, but it has to be like that. Like I'm, listen, there's no difference between you and me. I just do something a little crazy, and that's how I. That's what I tell people when I open with my motivational speaking. I'm like, I'm up here talking to you guys because I'm just in this position. That's all. But there's really no different. There's no difference, you know. And then I tell them like, listen, I go to therapy because I punch people in the face for a living, and it doesn't affect me. Like that's not normal. Like it takes a very special woman to be able to do what we do. Like we're not, we're different. We're a different breed, you know. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. I definitely so agree. We're not, better, we're not better than anybody. We're just different. Mm -hmm. And different life experiences and different. And, and what's so interesting about your, your experience is that you literally went through all the different, you saw everything that happened in boxing from the nineties till, till now. And just the, the evolution yeah. in a bad way, good way, just the evolution itself. And you're privy to information that we're not, you know what I mean? So experienced it yeah like firsthand yeah so that's why i i, I just i i thought that it was super 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 interesting and you know people... oh uh this is uh i know his name Chorizo. hold on is my son king oh uh, what's his name oh he's a big Wait, is he not a wheaton is he he's he's um he's a cavapoo oh and he's... he looks like a wheaton he, uh, well he's a uh... A lot of people think he looks like a um, a golden doodle. Yeah, golden doodle or we I saw Wheaton Terrier. His 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 ears probably. Oh, he's cute. What's his name? His name is King. King. <laughs> oh, cute. How much does he weigh? He's twenty five pounds, but we're like oh, yeah. in. The, he was just dead asleep right now, so he's like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "What are you doing to me?" Look at Chorizo. Look over here. Look, Chorizo King. Look. Chorizo's only eight and a half pounds. Oh, he's so cute. I love. Oh, him. I'm a huge fan of the uh the hair because I oh, always get that's his, I mean, that's his thing. Yeah. And his mohawk. Oh my goodness. It's so cute. They're the best. They're better than people. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This is this honestly is my he's my best friend. Oh yeah, that's Trudy So. I, I yeah, I do everything with him. He understands, he understands full blown English, like maybe uh 150 words I feel like he just acknowledges everything I say <laughs> but the poodle the poodle mixes are so smart yeah he I mean yeah they are actually they are and he's the 50 smartest. I think they're like up I mean he's Dotson poodle he's stubborn like a Dotson but he's very smart and he yeah. and they're like That's he's like Dotson poodle so he's long like if you see he's he's kind of long oh, he's long my last interview they introduced me to their puppy also Oh, and dog people are the best. And it's just, <laughs> and then there was a whole little segment on. I'm, I think I'm going to start doing this. Just introduce your puppy segment here. I this know, a, I know, like fighters and puppies. Like yeah. Dogs are. yeah. So, but like you okay. said, like, as far as the education part, like you got to understand that, like, not a lot of people know. So I feel like people get like, oh, I'm sorry. Like when they hear, they they're like, oh wow, like they didn't know who I was. And then they research me, and they're like, oh wow. I'm like, it's okay. Like yeah, but, you don't have know who I am like I am you know I can tell you who I am you know what I mean like and, and then they read and they they are their research and they're like oh wow like I'm sure a lot of people on Twitter I got a ton of followers because they research like I can't you know what I mean like oh, I'm just but you know what I think that that's the way to I, honestly that's that's what we're gonna do I think that we have to literally because Twitter's Twitter's the best platform to even uh little kiss there <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah each little each little following is going to turn into obviously one huge following for Maureen Shea. You know what I mean? And I, I, you know, I didn't tell you, but I was an English major and I took journalism classes and I did write for eight count news. It was a boxing website back in the day. So I've been in that position and I, I had my own talk show in, in um, the Bronx called Shea's corner. And my um, own, it was a live talk show on a Bronx. And every single aspect there is to boxing. 
literally I've, I've done everything but referee and judge i've promoted i did a pr for irish Oak promotions um i i ran a gym i was the president of a box of a gym a boxing gym um in in jersey um what else did i do so you did promotion you did uh you you know the promotional side so you know the I had, bs I had, yeah i had i had uh pandora promotions and i promoted alicia ashley at her world title fight i had her as the first main event at the masonic temple me and my manager yeah from pandora promotions is what we had so yeah so nobody can get anything by you you know you know the yeah my the manager and the reason i i've been with my manager since i was 21 years old he was the first coach that took mm -hmm. me seriously and he took me to my first amateur fight and then he brought me to Hector Roca, you know, and he, and, and he knows, like, he knows women's boxing. He knows women's boxing better than me. He's like the best manager in women's boxing because he knows all these girls and he knows what, the business. What is his take on this? It must be super frustrating for him then if oh, he's, he's you. No, he knows. He's, I mean, shoot, you could talk to him. He's, you know, he, mm -hmm. I tell him, oh, you should come on these interviews with me because he has so much information and so much, and it's not just, you know, it's a lot of people. Yeah. You know? A lot, a lot of different, he has a lot of different takes on, the, and again, it's not the female's fault. It's not the women, you know, it's not their fault. They don't know. Yeah, you know? exactly. Really what's happening here is just not right. You know, when you signed that contract with Matchroom, was that a breach on their part at all? Or they just ignored no, it? And ignored no, it. They never sent it into the IBF. I was going to ask you, I, I know that you don't have to, but would you be open to moving, moving to bantamweight? Yeah, I Fight, I could fight down. I was ranked at 118 when only when I was ranked number two when when um when um Ebony Bridges and Shannon and kind of Shannon Courtney fought each other for the title. You were ranked number two when the number eight and nine were fighting for the title. That was the <laughs> All right, this this, this is okay. my first rodeo. I've been in this position quite a few times. Yeah, this is it's almost it's almost like we have to do a part two of this because I have to I have to try to fit I have to do some brainstorming here now that I know the whole entire situation because if you want to talk to Luigi, I could put you in touch with him. Oh yeah, that would be that would be amazing to find to see that perspective also. Because let's say there was um a female amateur looking to turn pro and they're on the fence about it. They don't really like what they're seeing that's going on in women's boxing. Should they push forward or what, what kind of words can you have for them? Oh, I think use boxing to, to help you with your life. You know, I said, I just I follow your, follow your, your dreams. I mean, your passion, if this is what you love, do it, do it and see where it goes, but always have a backup plan, you know, always make, yeah, always get your education, make sure you, you know, you know, anything you experience, you, you, you know, you just make sure that you can apply it, you know, and, and build that resume inside and outside the ring. I mean, that's kind of what I did. Um, but I would say there's definitely more opportunity for young girls now. And, and because of women like myself who are speaking out in the state of women's boxing in the United States, you know, I mean, it's not just enough to say, oh, it's like the WNBA. It's just like that. I'm like, okay, but what does that mean? And what can we do to change that? Like, okay, just let it go. Like it is what it is. But I think, you know, it's people like me speaking out about it. And again, I'm not hating or, or jealous of any of these girls that are doing it. I'm glad, but there needs to be more because there are more. Yeah, that's that. That's the biggest thing right there. I wanted to make. I wanted to make, make. Uh, I wanted to raise the awareness that this is not. This is not you complaining. This is not you. You know, this is you raising literally, telling telling it how it is and raising awareness of a situation. Then you know. Thank you so much. No really. No thank you. No um, you have, definitely, we'll stay in contact and sure. um, we'll just we'll, we'll we'll chat. We'll chat again. All right. Sounds good.